Hello and welcome to the Sharpening Report. I am your host, Josh Peck. I am very excited to welcome, for the first time on the show, Sean Tabbitt. He's never been on the show before, but he and I are good friends. We've uh, been in contact for years now. I actually was familiar with his work before I was even, you know, really super active in full-time ministry. So uh, this is uh, this is an honor for me. We welcome Sean Tabbitt, host of the Sean Tabbitt Show. Sean, it's a pleasure to welcome you. How are you doing? Josh, I'm doing fantastic. I always eagerly look forward to any time you and I get to connect. It's been a while since we've seen each other in person, so I feel like we're finding all these virtual ways uh, to have community and pour into uh, the different places you and I get to speak uh, with our audiences. So thanks, man. Excited to see what comes of our show, our time today. Yeah, yeah, me too. I know we have a we have a lot of important stuff to talk about. Uh, before we get into that, though, for those who might not be familiar, which, which this actually surprised me because you, your show is excellent. I mean, I, I love your show and um, you don't have a lot of subscribers. So I, I'm highly encouraging everybody out there. If you're a subscriber to this channel, you're going to love Sean Tabbitt's uh, show. Go, go subscribe to him on YouTube. Uh, his show actually it really does deserve it and i i think you're going through some youtube su- suppression because you have great guests uh you have you have a really great rapport with your guests um all, all of your guests are well known like everybody would recognize these names and the only thing and you've been doing it for a long time so the only thing that makes sense to me is youtube's probably suppressing you and i think they're doing that to this channel as well so uh it's time for us christians to help each other out so everybody go subscribe to sean but uh uh before we get into the the uh you know building up of the church what's been going on the past couple Couple of years in the body, how we as Christians can react to that. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself for those not familiar with you, how you came to know Christ uh, and how that led to what you do today? Yeah, so uh, in terms of uh, coming to know Christ, I actually grew up in the church. I don't remember a time that I wasn't in church. I remember growing, going to Sunday school uh, at like three, four years old. So I've been in church my entire life. Uh, in terms of like making a, a solid, real heartfelt commitment to Christ, <laughs> Uh, that would have come about the age of 13. I remember watching uh, a Billy Graham crusade on TV, and there was something uh, in that call, that altar call, that really just touched my heart. And so from that that point, I, I kind of look at that age 13. From that point forward is uh, where I consider myself like a, a legit Christ follower. Uh, I had always had aspirations to go into ministry, and then I became a tech guy and was in software and, and tech support for like 11 years. Um, but ironically, or, or in God's providence, it came back around. I, I ended up in the Christian publishing industry. Uh, I had met my wife working at a Christian bookstore in college. And so uh, I remember at the time, uh, early on in my tech career, I was like, you know, when I get into my 30s, I really would like to do something with books again, because it's something I'm really passionate about. And I, I ended up kind of charting a different path. I'd been very successful, um, but just felt like God was pushing us in a new direction. So for about eight, nine years ago, Uh, I jumped ship, left my tech career behind, and now work in the Christian publishing space. I've had a bunch of different jobs over the past eight years, uh, and right now I've landed or found my my I hope what I hope is my forever home uh, at Norai Media Group. Uh, I'm an acquisitions and publishing marketing executive, which is a fancy way to say I get like nine jobs. Um, I acquire new books, I acquire video content, podcast content. Um, I do a lot of marketing and author support and just kind of everything else in between. So sort of a, a jack of all trades. But uh, as you as I'm sure you know, Josh, you know, when you're kind of a tech person and you, you self teach, you, you, you are able to uh, figure out a lot of stuff on your own. So I love the variety that I get to do. It challenges me in a good way. Um, and outside of my career, uh, I'm married for 23 years. My wife and I have 10 kids ranging from a year and a half up to 22. And so uh, they're all still at home. Life is never dull. And yeah, man, I'm I'm loving life. My 40s are a, a fantastic season for me. Wow, ten kids! I'm I'm catching up. We're expecting our fifth actually in just a couple of weeks here. Possibly by the time that this is out, our fifth child will be here. So, <laughs> so that's really cool. That's awesome. Well, congratulations, man! Five. That's a big deal. I always tell people once you go past two, then it doesn't really matter how many more you add because yes. when you're outnumbered, you're like, oh my gosh, we can't make. It. But I find once you get three or four, you're in that rhythm where. Um, I feel like that's where you start to yield to parenting and, yep. and you, you just and you and you also see this as you have more kids. You love every kid differently, uniquely. And, uh, you know, it's uh, we don't think we we're really great parents if we had one or two kids. It's when you get to three, four five and beyond. 
uh, that's when uh, the rubber meets the road. Yeah, I totally agree with you. We've uh, we've experienced the same thing, and there was a little bit of a heart attack moment with the second kid because I, w- I was raised as an only child, so I never had brothers and sisters, didn't know how I was going to deal with that. Turned out to be way better and easier than I thought it was going to be because, you know, a lot, a lot of times other, you know, kind of more dishonest parents, they'll, they'll try to make it sound like parenting is a lot worse than it is. It's really not that big of a deal, and uh, we, we naturally are built for that so you kind of just let your natural you know inclinations take over and it, it's really a blessing uh but yeah then so after the third or fourth that's where i experienced the same thing as you did you know, you know i remember when i when i was first starting in ministry work myself i was uh writing my my very first book and i remember this was back in the early days of like Facebook and social media. And every once in a while, I would see something from this guy, Sean Tabbitt, and it was usually talking about some uh, new book that came out. And I, I always remember just thinking like the way that you would write about these and explain them and review them and things, it, it just, it came across as like, like intellectual and smart and down to earth. And I really enjoyed reading those. And I, I remember thinking, man, if if I ever get a chance someday to have like a book reviewed by this guy or to 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 talk to him or meet him or something, that I I just thought that would be so cool. And then uh, a few years later, we actually did get to meet in person because we both had uh, speakers tables next to each other at a conference, so we got to meet there, hit it off, and uh, we've been in contact ever since. And so uh, for for those not familiar, I was uh, able to go on your show uh, about four months ago, I think, for Silent Cry: The Darker Side of Trafficking. So everybody, if you haven't had a chance, go watch that interview and then subscribe to Sean's channel. Uh, so that was a blessing for me. And then that led to me having to bring you on uh, to my show because you, you have you have a lot of, uh, I think, really unique but needed insights into our time today, uh, what Christians are going through. And I think a lot of that is, is through your ministry work and just how you've been uh, really active in getting a lot of different people's uh, perspectives, putting those together, and just seeing how other Christians, you know, like even readers and stuff, have been um, uh, kind of experiencing, especially the last year. So I, I want to talk a little bit about the year 2020. I, I've heard you refer to it as a refining gift, um, but there's a lot of Christians that kind of feel like they're in despair, uh, and that started you know last year. The, the The church in the first century, though, was founded through persecution, but it seems a lot different now, 2,000 years later. What happened in 2020, and how have Christians uh, been reacting to it? Yeah, you know, I think, uh, like like you said, I, I think of 2020 as a gift, and that's not to trivialize the hardships. We all had various hardships between some of us got sick with COVID. We have family members that get sick. Some of us lost family and friends, lost jobs. So uh, not to belittle hardships. I know we all went through a lot of difficulties last year, and, and many of those difficulties are continuing to 2020, 20, excuse me, I'm so many 20s, 2021 as well. Uh, but one of the things that 2020 caused us to be able to do was uh, be forced to break all of our routines. Yeah. Um, I've heard it said it takes about 60 days and then you're completely out of a routine or a cycle that you were stuck in. And once we got past that 60 day mark, in terms of going back to what it meant to do church life before, I, ju- I just feel like we crossed a threshold. Uh, I, I don't I don't necessarily think doing church, so to speak, going forward will be the same. It's it's just going to look different. People have developed different habits, different routines. They've have to had to wrestle with what does it mean for me to be a Christian as, as uh, their beliefs have gotten tested all of last year? Um, they've gotten to really wrestle with, well, what does it mean for me to be in community? Am, am I getting the same thing off of a Facebook Live or a Zoom sermon versus uh, what I'm receiving there in person? Um, I, I think probably the most eye-opening thing we saw last year was just the challenges a lot of church leaders faced in terms of do they stay open? Do they close their doors? Uh you know, do they defy the government if the government's pushing back strongly on them? Do they actually address what's going on in culture uh, through a biblical lens? Or uh, do they give in to whatever culture said they had to be all about last year? It was a very difficult time uh, to be a leader last year. Uh, I feel like uh, especially our millennial leaders really struggled because in that generation, there's a tendency to want to always go to your peers and Facebook and the Internet and social media to solve your problems or good ideas. And I feel like last year was a time that we needed the wisdom of the grandfathers and grandmothers and mothers and fathers, people who've got 10, 20, 30, 40 more years life experience than we do, uh, who can give us some perspective on the hard times that they went through. Um, The other thing I would say, too, though, is even though we have felt like we've gone under or gone through a season of extreme persecution here in the church, when I look at what's going on in other parts of the world or think of the the stories I've read uh, in many of the 
Voice of the Martyrs publications through the years, we're at preschool level here in terms of persecution and what we're experiencing. And so while for us here in the U- U.S., it feels like this has been extreme persecution, this is super entry level. So, uh, you know, there could be more on the horizon for 2021. I don't think this is going to be an easy year. But at the same time, going back to that, that gift idea, uh, you know, to actually be given a time where we're forced to be quiet, slow down, back off and really examine That is a gift, and we're going to have to wrestle with what does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to walk boldly in faith uh, going forward? And it's not going to look the same. It probably can't look the same as it did before. Uh, And there's never anything bad about like kind of testing your beliefs and uh, really being grounded in what you believe. Because that's where I feel it it makes an extreme difference in the choices you make and how you live your life. We could coast before, and I feel like our days of coasting have ended and let's welcome it. Just embrace it. You, you, can't, you can long for what was, but what was is likely, for the most part, gone. So you're going to have to embrace what's coming because, well, that's probably the only road you have. Yeah, very true. It brings a, uh, a Bible, ver- and this is going to be a peck paraphrase because I don't have the Bible memorized and I usually don't have verses up uh, on, on my computer as I'm thinking about that. That's going to be a new Bible edition, the, the, peck, the paraphrase peck paraphrase, paraphrase. edition. I- It'll be three pages long. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a summary what you need to know. Yeah, exactly. There will be a lot of ums and uhs and stuttering and things. But I, uh, it reminds me of uh, the, the Bible verse that says something along the lines of... Um, uh, it, it's not that everything will be good, but but God can work things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purposes. So it doesn't mean that everything will be good in and of itself, but that all of those bad things, all those trials, all those horrible things, he can work them together. I, I, I kind of, I, I think of it as like ingredients to a cake. No one's going to eat raw egg, raw sugar. You know, you shouldn't eat raw sugar. It might be delicious, but it's really bad for you. Raw flour. All of them are kind of bad things just in and of themselves separately. But when you work them together, add a little bit of heat, which is important too, uh, then you you come out with a beautiful cake. I I think that sometimes trials and tribulations and things like that can be the same thing. They're bad, but God can work those together for good. I actually, I I think this was a total Holy Spirit thing because I was not even thinking about... um, our interview today when I wrote this and I I was watching, I was actually watching an Andy Woods sermon and uh, it it just kind of, you know, a thought struck me. And so usually when that happens, I, because I'm a millennial too, I immediately go to Facebook and I have to post about it. Uh, But this kind of makes me think about what, um, what we're talking about right now. And I, 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 talking about trials and things, I said, I know uh, many Christians in this country are going through trials right now and they are more than likely going to get worse. Uh, While that doesn't sound encouraging at First, we need to remember that trials uh, for us are opportunities to fall into pride, bitterness, and sin, or to learn, grow, and be rewarded with one of the five crowns mentioned in Scripture. Um, we should be encouraged and remember to strive for the latter. So James one twelve says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. And then Revelation 2.10 says, uh, Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. So from Revelation, we learn that uh, we learn that promise was made to a specific church, but from James, we learn that promise is available to all believers. Salvation is just the beginning. There are rewards that can be earned through our trials, uh, or we can let those opportunities go to waste and fall into bitterness. That's Satan's reward. Either way, trials are coming, and we will earn heavenly blessings from God or temporal curses from Satan. So let's deny Satan, stay faithful to God, and allow Jesus to bless us through these trials. So you know, it, it it's funny that I, I thought of that today, and, and it connects so well, I think, with our conversation here. I think that was a Holy Spirit thing. Um, because in thinking of 2021, a lot of Christians have a lot of despair with that. But I, more and more, I feel like with me personally, God's working on my spirit and, and saying, you know, yeah, there's probably going to be bad, some bad things that are going to happen, but it's an opportunity. You know, light shines brightest in the darkness. Uh, what, what do you think 2020 is going to bring? And do you think the church uh, will look different? And could that actually be a good thing? Yeah, I think in terms of uh, to touch on the despair piece that you mentioned, uh, I think a lot of that comes by the voices you're li- listening to. You know, what what sermons are you listening to? What are you reading? What news is coming into your mind? What are you seeing on social media? So I feel like that has a tendency to steer kind of our feelings, 
and what we're thinking about. And so on the one hand, I would encourage you to, you know, align yourself or find pastors who have really solid teaching, who are looking at what's ahead as a, as a time for Christians to be empowered and stand for truth and actually get out of their community and do things and serve and make a difference and uh, impact culture. Uh, you know, if, if the preaching last year in your church and as you go into this new year, it's continuing where it's all about your destiny and having your best life and all, and all these things where it's more almost psychology and counseling and, you know, about uh, if really the sermons always basically come down to like what's in your local orbit, y- you and your family or maybe your neighborhood, but there's never a focus beyond impacting or changing the world. That's a very small life. And while in and of itself, I could say, well, it's not necessarily a bad thing because we do need encouragement. We do need to shift things in our life. The reality is culture has changed. Um, the problems that we're facing are bigger than we've, you know, they've always been out there, but maybe now a lot of them are just more uh, magnified. So we see them on, on a larger scale. So I guess to some degree, I go, which game are you going to be in? Are you going to be about this safe little life with your, you know, encouragement, self-help sermons and, and church? Or uh, is it going to mean something? Are you going to go rescue kids out of traffic? Are, are you going to go help the hungry and the homeless. And, and not that I want to be all about social justice, but those are real needs in the world. We all have friends and family, people who've lost jobs, people who have lost their home, all these different things. And I, I feel like some of it is b- slowing down enough and being willing to listen to the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit prompts you, it's like, hey, your friend over there, like they, they need money right now. And just, just when you're prompted, just go for it. And I find often when my wife and I just respond in obedience, when God shows us something, uh, there's a return on it. And not that I'm giving to get back, but often as we pour resources into other people, we find additional resources come back into our family for us to use or do other things with. So, uh, you know, it seems like there is kind of a, a, a process or an economy in God's world where as as we give everything out, it, it comes back into at the same time. Um, but in terms of uh, what's on the horizon for the church this year, uh, one of the big shifts I, th- I think is coming. And, and if you flow in a lot of the prophetic circles people are talking right now about the third reformation of the church or we've crossed the threshold into a new era and whatnot um we're probably entering into an age of micro church or smaller church i still think we'll see like uh larger parts of the body sort of being a hub and a wheel with sort of further down the spoke you have more of these house churches or smaller uh smaller gatherings I i can say for my family that's what we've shifted into this year um, whereas we had, we had a lot of things that challenged us with the preaching at our local church last year. And we've uh, purposefully chosen to separate ourselves from our, our local body here. And we're now fellowshipping with, you know, several groups of family uh, on a weekly basis and watching, you know, teaching from uh, a pastor that we really appreciate down in Texas. And that's an extreme shift for us. We've never done that before in all 23 years that we've been married, but there were some lines crossed that for us were like, these are just things we can't compromise on. And so, I think you really need to be willing to be about truth and what the Bible says. And if you're feeling convicted on something or it's just it's, it's a bridge too far and you can't cross it, it's OK. You know, you can be bold and go in a different direction. Relationally, it's painful. You're going to have some hurt feelings. Relationships are going to be broken. Uh, but at the same thing, we need to be in a place where what we believe actually stands for something and, and makes a difference. And, and the choices we make uh, are impacted by our, our beliefs. And I just feel like this, this is the time a lot of us have had to wrestle with these things at this level for the first time. You know, we've, I feel like a lot of us early on, we're, we're dealing with a lot of our personal sin issues and challenges as we're being sanctified and growing in faith. Um, and now we're being put to the test. Well, how does your faith actually impact what you're doing in your job and culture and your church experience? And, uh, you know, I, th- I think for a lot of us, we've never been uh, had our feet put to the fire in that way before. And so it's it's I feel like the the refining, a lot of us are refining has been like very close to us. But now the refining and the shifting is going out even further to the places where we have influence and, and work and do life. And so it's just uh, I feel like God's inviting us into a season where our faith experience, walking it out, actually impacts all areas of our life in, in a real transparent way. We get away from compartmentalizing everything where God's like. I just want your everything. And that, I feel like that's kind of the invitation he's allowing us to step into. Uh, and we should embrace it. It's a good thing. On the other side of that, I think we'll be thankful that we said yes. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And th- this is something, too, that I've uh, I've been 
really focusing on too is you know the great commission i i see a difference between you know just getting saved or just being saved and being a disciple or being like a real christian like actually following jesus you know i i i uh i forget which book it is but in one of my books i i wrote um you know there's a difference between being saved and being a christian and and what that means is you can accept, you know, you can accept a gift and then not ever use it. So you can accept a gift of salvation, but if you don't ever use it and you don't ever like w- walk with Jesus and actually have a relationship with him and, and be discipled. And, and if you don't do that, you're missing out on what life is really all about. I mean, that's the, that's the whole point because the great commission, uh, tells us not, it doesn't say go out and get everybody saved. It says go out and make disciples of all nations. And I, I think that's that sanctification process that you were talking about. That's, that's discipleship. And uh, I, I think that's important, and that's something that we've we've missed out on. How important that is, you, you know. God doesn't want to just get us saved. I mean, that's important. Obviously, we don't want people to go to hell, but but we can't do that and then deny the relationship with the one that gave us that gift in the in the first place. And uh, so I'm hoping, like uh, like what you said, I'm, I'm hoping that these conditions of, of having to kind of be more close quarters and having to do like I, I love the idea of like home church I love the idea of Christians gathering together at somebody's house and like watching a sermon online and then like talking about it or even just doing a Bible study like that I, I've, I've always been a huge advocate of that um, and not that there's anything wrong with you know big churches either I think that's fine too but uh, but I, I think that God's moving in that direction because it's, it's more personal and I think God can work more personally in our lives in that type of situation because we're not getting lost in the crowd at that point. Uh, so that discipleship is, I think, will flourish more in situations like that. And and like you said, if that continues on through 2021, we could be seeing more of that. So how should we uh, handle equipping and discipling uh, Christians? And, and how have we as the church failed in that in recent history? Yeah, I, you know, I think in terms of a, a lot of the historic discipleship programs, I, I felt like it's been more about acclimating people to Either on the one hand, like, hey, this is how we do life at our local church. So welcome, honey. We're so glad you're here. Uh, you feel like a fish out of a wa- out of water. Here's how we do everything here. You know, three, four, get settled in. Welcome, you're home, and go go do life and sort of disciple like entry level discipleship. Where I feel like it was more about adding people to the local church. Um, and then I feel like a lot of the resources we've seen through the years have focused on like. Christianity 101 and kind of very basics of the faith, Bible, theology, knowledge, all fine. Mm-hmm. Um, but if that's where the discipleship ends and there's never anything more intentional, uh, it comes up kind of short. You know, we, we have Sunday school and we might we're going to do a book study. And so we'll, we'll find the you know popular book and we'll all walk through that together. Not necessarily bad, but I feel like, you know, I think you could almost look at Jesus and the disciples as a model for what discipleship disciples uh what, what that actually should look like and so i have a good friend chad norris um he's down at bridgeway church in greenville and they've they've got a school they started about two years ago called the ascent and it started with a small group of like not nine students i think they've got like 65 students now uh, but basically they have smaller cohort groups within the larger group where it's you know eight ten people doing life and so it's messy it's difficult at times but you know it's very sharpening and that's very intentional um, and, and so I feel like that's, that's partly what we need to get back into in terms of maybe you're part of a larger body or group, but you know, the, the actual discipleship and the sharpening is happening in smaller groups. Uh, but something way, way more intentional, way more honest and raw and open than just a, Oh, I would meet with my small group or I have a Bible study again, all fine. But you know, we put on our happy face, we smile, we're not necessarily challenging each other. We're just being nice. We're, you know, and so uh, I feel like there's a a depth in what we sh- need to be stepping into that maybe we just weren't willing to go uh, that deep with people before. Maybe maybe self protection, whatever it was. But um, it, uh, th- that's the thing I can't get rid of in terms of uh, thinking about resources and new books and projects in the next few years. What does it look like to disciple and equip people over the next three to five years? What does it look like to equip people here in the states to face more difficulties when? when, you know, a good chunk of culture says your beliefs are garbage and you should just be silenced. You know, how we've never faced that before, many of us. So how do I stay strong to my faith and express my beliefs? I feel like there's going to be a lot more in terms of, we, you had uh, mentioned this earlier, in terms of challenges with social media, with uh, accounts getting canceled and banned and all the problems we've seen in the last couple of months. Um, how do I continue to preach a message 
uh, to the world through channels and mediums that may try to silence me or mute my voice. You know, I, I, there may be a higher level of creativity and out of the box thinking we're going to have to uh, step into. So, uh, but yeah, in terms of discipling uh, in our it's smaller groups is what I'm thinking, you know, probably so, sub 10, 10 people groups. And then uh, in terms of discipling or impacting culture, uh, we need to uh, still be willing to be bold and be out there on all the places we can speak. You know, I, we saw lots of friends, oh, I'm leaving Facebook and I'm leaving Twitter and I'm this and I'm that. And hey, if, if that's how God convicted you, be blessed, go for it, you know. But uh, I, I was just like, well, but I still want to speak to people on Facebook, Twitter and all these other places. You know, I've spent many years building up <laughs> uh, an audience base that I can connect with and I'm not just going to throw that away because I get to connect with Christians and non-Christians and people in between. And, um, you know, I, I want to be in, in all the places I can be speaking. So uh, I feel like that's kind of another aspect of that. We, you know, we need to use the, the platforms and the channels we have to disciple culture and to impact culture. And so uh, don't throw away what you've been building because you're angry or you're frustrated. Uh, we, in the end, we may all get canceled anyways <laughs> with how it's going lately, but we still do need to utilize all the tools, steward all the tools to speak to culture, whether that's broadcasting to a larger crowd or you know, a larger group of people whose lives we can speak into. Yeah, I've noticed that too. Um, that because me, I, I've had that question too. You know, I've I've been getting hit with censorship, you know, for the past couple of years, and there's there's always that temptation to well take my ball and go home. You know, I I'll just not be on this then. But there's something that keeps holding me back from making that decision. And and, and like you said, sometimes God is going to guide people to do that. You know, sometimes it is better uh, for somebody to just get off the social media. Uh, like for example. Um, I, I, I pretty much removed myself from politics because of what it was doing to me. Cause I realized, okay, there is a, there is a point of spiritual immaturity here in myself and I'm not handling politics right. There are people who can and there's, they're more spiritually mature in that area. So that's great. I wouldn't advise this for everybody, but for me, uh, I realized, you know, I need to work on some things with myself, some insecurities, some, maybe some pride issues. I need to work on some things before I can handle this specific area. It, it, with the maturity that it really needs, especially in our day today. So I, I completely backed off. I mean, if somebody asks me, I'll talk and stuff like that, but I don't make it a focus of my ministry anymore the way that I used to. And so, um, I think with, with some people that might be the case with social media that, you know, God might be directing them to just remove from it completely because it's doing more spiritual harm to themselves, uh, that, than it would. And maybe there's something they need to work on. But I think with a lot of people, it's exactly what you said. I, I think that people are making an emotional decision and just decide deciding, well, fine, if they're going to do that, then I'm not going to use their platform, which I get, you know, I don't want to support a satanic company either, because we have to remember these social media companies are companies and we are supporting them. Um, even though we're not really spending our money, we're allowing them to make money through advertising and things like that. So there's a lot of different areas to look at, but I think instead of thinking through that, you know, carefully and thoughtfully, I think a lot of people make an emotional decision to just remove themselves and just get off the platform because they're mad, like you said. And I think that does show a maturity problem, uh, one of many that that's infiltrated the church when it should be, you know, well, I've spent years building this. I don't want to just give up. Um, I would rather see if there's a way, because if I can only talk to a thousand people, you know, that's still better. You know, it, it, even if, like, if I used to be able to talk to, okay, my YouTube channels. I, I uh, had an 80,000 subscriber YouTube channel not too long ago, and YouTube deleted it. And I did have that temptation to just remove myself from YouTube completely. But I have this second channel that I'm using now. And at the time, it only had a couple of hundred subscribers. Right now, it's got two or 3,000, somewhere around there. And, and I had to think, okay, even if it's only 200, that, that in a church is a pretty big congregation. If I can only speak to 200, that's still better than nothing. You know, that's still better than zero. So, uh, so I decided to keep it and it's, it's growing and it'll probably get deleted again. But, uh, that's why we built Daily Renegade. Um, but, uh, so I, I think that people are making an emotional decision without, Thinking about it, the other thing, too, where a lot of the spiritual immaturity that Christians have has really been shown online uh, up up until recently, and I'm wondering if that is contributing to some of the reason God might be allowing this censorship to happen. And it's an uncomfortable thought. I don't really know what side of the fence I am with it, but I know that 
for years, I in my ministry, I've been speaking out against how Christians, by and large, treat each other online. Or I wouldn't say by and large, the majority of Christians are awesome. I think that this is a very loud minority. But when you go online, look at, especially Facebook, Twitter is a big one. How is Christianity being represented? There's a lot of uh, fighting, a lot of vitriol, a lot of um, uh, reviling, which Paul said to stay away from revilers completely. Uh, So there's a lot of that, and that's how Christianity is being represented to, you know, atheists or to to non-Christians, because they they go online, they see that extremely loud minority, because most other people who don't want anything to do with that, they stay out of it. Uh, They don't post, you know, they want to be left alone. So that's the only representation that Christianity is getting. Well, that is harming people's ability to come to Christ or even to uh, even to think about it logically. So that it's it's I don't know how I feel about it just yet, but it's it's put that question in my head. Could it be possible that while the censorship stuff is evil, you know, could it be possible God might be allowing some of it because Christianity has not been represented well by Christians? Uh, you, you know, it, it's either the the loud minority that's that's showing that that's giving it the appearance that we're all horrible uh, hypocrites, or it's the ones that don't engage and they they just would rather be left alone and they're letting all that happen. I don't know for sure, but I know with me. Uh, there was a time where I was one of these online people that would bicker and stuff years, but you know, before I got into ministry and, uh, before I could really get into ministry, God had to, God, God had to get a hold of me and spend time with me, uh, getting that pride out of myself and, and, and showing how much harm I, I could be causing. Like if he allowed me to have the ministry that I have now back then, I would have done so much harm and, and I would have thought that I was doing good. So, um, I, I'm thinking that that might play into it too, but, but in regards with what you said about the maturity, do you see a maturity problem in the church today? And what what should we do about that? What kind of things can can even be done about that? Uh, I want to touch on the social media aspect yeah. first. Um, I, I think one of one of the challenges we we face is we often will portray a different persona online than we are in in person yes. or at home or with friends. And so this is one of the things I warn authors about early on, where I'm like, you know the the persona you build online, let that be who you really are, because other people are going to expect that, that is who you are. And so uh, I feel like, you know, living a separate life or, or a secret life online where you portray yourself one way versus who you really are. Uh, we need to be really careful that we're not um, just channeling a bunch of ick and angst uh, through all of our social media. And so, uh, you know, I feel like you if it's not something you'd be willing to say to somebody in person, you probably shouldn't say that to them on Twitter. Um, and I, I think you pick up uh, or bring up a good point in terms of a Christian witness and how we're portraying the body of Christ to the world. We all have non-Christian friends and, and you know, Christian friends, everything in between. And people look at what we do and they judge the fruit of what we're sharing online and how we're representing ourselves. And that does, even if it's in a small way, uh, it does impact how people perceive the body of Christ. We are all representations of the body of Christ in the different places we're talking and influencing and such. And so uh, we shouldn't take that lightly. I feel like sometimes we don't grasp the importance or the severity of that. And so uh, we really need to think of who we're representing and how that plays out, how that impacts how we're uh, talking and interacting on social media. Um, in terms of maturity, I've been thinking a lot about this uh, this past year. Uh, I have a, a book project that I'm working on right now that kind of ties into this. So, so I've been giving it a lot of uh, brain space, if you will. But I feel I feel like what last year showed us in terms of uh, what we saw, especially from like I'm I'm a Gen Xer. I think you said you're a millennial. Especially our our two generations. Um, a lot of us grew up in broken homes, single parent homes. You know, you 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 add to the list. You know, uh, there are a lot of challenges for families uh, in our younger days. Um, so a, a lot of us don't necessarily know where we came from or have a good relationship with where we came from. We're not really sure what we're doing at the present because things are just, you know, especially for our two generations, the, what the future holds is a big question mark. So life presently is a mess. And because of the previous two, we're not really sure what our future is, what our mission is. And so I, I feel like especially for the millennials and the Xers, you have these two listless sort of lost generations. And that's where you can do a stance. The, the rage headline of the day will do. I'm all about that today. Or. Um, we're going to go change the world, so let's go march and in, in, in protest this or do that. Where I feel like we're easily drawn into 
uh, various movements, many movements which are completely antithetical and opposed to what we believe as Christians, uh, yet we're so desperate to belong. We're so desperate to be a part of a group, a community where, where I'm, I feel like I have a voice, I have meaning, I'm important, I'm doing something, I'm accomplishing something. Uh, and, and I feel like that that's, for me, that was one of the big gaping holes society and in the church that was exposed last year especially is you know, think of the people we saw friends and family you know being all about different things last year where we were like oh, i didn't know you had opinions about that or i didn't know that was important to you or uh, that like where did, where did this come from you have talked about this before so but yet they they were swept up because they wanted to belong they wanted to feel like they were doing something important and so and it's not to say we shouldn't go go whole hog into causes that are important and places we want to pour ourselves into. I think there are good things we can certainly go after, but there, I think there is a real tangible issue that uh, you know, our two generations are, are kind of lost. We need to wrestle deeply with our identity, who we are. And I think for a lot of us, we need to ask Jesus into our timeline to help us redeem our past and get healing from the things we experienced as kids to get things kind of settled and on track here in the present. So we can, uh, you know, partner with God to step into a, a future where we're on mission to what he's calling us to step into as Christians. And, and that, that might look different or feel weird if we've not uh, stepped into that before. But uh, for, for me, in terms of uh, maturity, I, I feel like a lot of us are stunted mostly because, um, you know, we've got broken things in our past and we don't know where, how to belong. And so it's intentional to partner with to heal some of those things you know, any movement will do because I, I just desperately want to be seen and noticed and belong. And so uh, that's what I that's what I saw. I feel like earlier in the Obama administration, when we had Occupy Wall Street and all these random protests that we'd never had before popping up. It was like, yeah, I'm going to go after that. Or, you know, people who are crazy, excited to talk about the environment ad nauseum and whatnot. Uh, and we saw all, all of that the last four years. So people are just desperate to belong and for better or worse, somehow the church has missed inviting people to belong into the church or people in the church don't even feel like they belong or they don't even know why they're there. Uh, Cause we th- have lots of Christian friends who latched onto some pretty surprising things last year. So uh, I feel like the maturity aspect, it's, it's a very deep seated identity issue that needs to be corrected, fixed, healed. Yeah, absolutely. And I like what you said in an email too. It's time it's time for Christians to uh put on our big boy pants because things are probably going to get kind of rough and we're we're really going to need each other. And I I think I think, you know, the the time for the you know, the real petty squabbling about things that really just, they don't matter. I mean, you know, you can have your opinion. Like, for example, the whole timing of the rapture thing. I, it matters, but not so much where we should be dividing over, you know, it. Or, or, or I mean, there, there there are specific things that we're told we should divide over, and that's not one of them. <laughs> uh, but things like that, you know, we, we found it so right. easy to break and fracture and not be, and not be um, uh, actually working as one body the way that we should be. Uh, so how, how can we, you know, in terms of application, how, how can we put our big boy pants on? You know, what, what would you want most for the audience to take away from this episode in terms of application? What are, what are some things that uh, Christians today that are listening, what, what are some changes they can start making uh, like right now uh, immediately? Uh, I would say on the one hand, uh, you know, the transformation revival, it starts with you. So, uh, we need to be in our prayer closets, praying, uh, seeking God, reading our Bible, uh, discipling our families. So start start with your own household first. I feel like that's always uh, a good place to start. And once you get that in order, then, then start uh, expanding out from there. Uh, I think we need to be mindful that we do uh, live in a difficult time. You know, we've had many friends talking this past year about, you know, are we living in the last times? Are we the last generation? Now, on the one hand, I go, well, every generation— since Jesus was here, has thought they were in the last time. So just take it with a grain of salt that, you know, throughout the history of the church, we've all felt like we were living in the end time. And I feel like a lot of us lost our way last year where we got stuck in a rut of being about all these other things and, and getting off track maybe for our ministries and what God had called us to be about in years past. It's not like those callings or things that God put us here to do had shifted last year. They continued last year. They continue into this new year. So um, it really, it really, press into a hearing from God about what he's calling you to do. Like what, what is your specific way that you, Sean, you, Josh, whoever, Mary, Susie, whoever is listening, watching, how, how can you specifically contribute to culture? How can you impact 
your family, your community, your world. And, and just know that, you know, the, the ways you impact culture aren't insignificant, whether it's on a micro level or you've got a podcast or a TV show on a macro level. All of those things are important. But in, in the same way to be about who you are and you know, like be who you are on social media, be who God has called you to be in the places you can influence culture uh, and and make a difference. And so uh, and uh, in the put your big boy pants and that comes from my good friend Troy Brewer, who says that a lot. But uh, to realize that uh, we are walking through a difficult season. We have friends who talk about it. it it's like wartime, you know, and, and especially there's so much spiritual warfare right now. It is a time to realize we, we need to be grown up not only in our lives and the choices we make, but grown up in our faith. And that means things look different. That means maybe we're a whole lot more intentional uh, about what we're doing. We, we can't just coast and mail it in, so to speak, like we did before. And that's going to be hard, but I feel like the, we need to build up our shoulders and build up the calluses on our hands. There, there are hard things coming, and uh, kind of the squishy preschool faith that a lot of us were, were operating in before, it's not going to cut it. You know, We need to be strong and ready for what, what is coming, and uh, it, it's going to take some building up to get to where we're ready to withstand the onslaught that's on the horizon. So I, I'm not a doom and gloom person by any means, but I also want to be realistic. Uh, we're we're going to see a lot of difficulties in the near term and probably in the years ahead. And um, for us to be uh, able to impact our family and our community and broader culture, they're going to, people are going to need to look to strong believers who have resources and answers for the problems that we're facing. So uh, if you want to be a part of God's solution, then set it, step into getting uh, slotted in right where God needs you to be, to be a part of what he's doing uh, in the earth uh, in the years ahead. And I, I think, I think you won't regret it. It's just, it's just going to look different. It's all going to look different, but that's okay. Just you know, step into what God's calling you to do. Uh, and I, I think you'll be amazed at the doors he opens for you to impact your world. Yes, t- absolutely. I, I totally agree. Uh, w- speaking of which, uh, finding uh, you know good people out there, finding good things to watch, getting some good information. Uh, where can people find you online and follow your show? Yeah, uh, my podcast is called the Sean Tabbitt Show. Uh, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify are other places to easily subscribe, so you can see every episode. Uh, my website's seantabbitt dot com. I've got a lot of content over there. Uh, very active on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Honestly, if you Google my name, Sean Tabbitt, you'll find me. I've been at this for a long, long time. And so lots of content. You can find lots of goofy pictures of me and everything else out there. So, uh, but yeah, uh, w- would love to interact with people. And uh, if my content blesses you or encourages you, uh, send me a note, share it with somebody. You know, for me, this is a labor of love in a way that I get to serve the church, serve the publishing community that I'm a part of, uh, and give back to all the people who've poured into me through the years. Excellent. And we'll have all those links available in the description below. Uh, Sean, thank you so much for coming on uh, the show tonight. We, we, we would be happy to have you back on anytime you want. This has been an absolute blast, and I, I think a lot of people are going to be blessed uh, by what you had to say today. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Well, my pleasure, Josh. And, man, anytime you and I can collaborate this year and in the years ahead, let's do that. I feel like we have a good rhythm and a flow when we talk. It's like we've known each other for years. So uh, anytime, man. All right. And, uh, yeah, I, I feel the ab- absolute same way. Uh, so, Sean, hang on the line a minute. I'll close this out here. Everybody else, thank you so much for watching. We are making this uh, episode totally free for everybody because it's important. <laughs> Not that all, all of our shows aren't. Uh, but this is one of the rare shows I don't think you YouTube is going to suppress this because we're not talking about really super controversial uh, things. And so because of that, we can give this one away for free. But uh, you should know that DailyRenegade.com is the place to go for full episodes of all of our shows. It's not just Sharpening Report. It's JPD Weekly. It's Detox Babylon. Uh, Gary Wayne, ha- you know, uh, author of Genesis 6 Conspiracy, has a show called The Christian Contrarian. We also have The Christian Marauder. So we have a lot of great shows, most of which you can't get anywhere else because YouTube deletes these things. And, and and suppresses them. So that's why we actually built Daily Renegade. DailyRenegade.com You can get a free trial right now for seven days. Uh, try it. See if you like it. If the ministry blesses you and you want to help support us, you can get a uh, membership and then you'll have full access. So all of that information is available at DailyRenegade.com So thank all of you so much for uh, watching and uh, we just really appreciate uh, your viewership. Until next time, love you all. Take care and God bless.